Good evening. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Michele Alacevic. I'm the Associate Director for Research Activities at the Heimann Center for the Humanities at Columbia University. The recent economic and financial crisis has been the subject of a, a wide uh, discussion and debates uh, uh, and analysis, and the Heimann Center has done its part. But uh, since we are a humanities center, our primary focus has been on the cultural context of the crisis. So we have organized uh, uh, events and workshop on uh, the culture of credit, uh, the um, debt in the long, uh, in historical perspective. Uh, and exactly one year ago, we've had uh, a terrific talk by Gillian Tett of the Financial Times uh, on uh, an anthropologist on Wall Street. And so tonight we uh, discuss uh, um, business schools and we ask uh, uh, what, uh, uh, where do business schools fit uh, in this picture and uh, uh, did their pedagogy play a role in the financial crisis or uh, can they have a role in promoting the public good? Our speakers uh, will uh, address uh, these uh, questions and others from uh, different but complementary perspectives. They are Martin Dixon, the U.S. managing editor of the Financial Times, formerly the chief of the New York Bureau, and from 2005 the deputy editor of the paper with particular responsibility for its global financial and business coverage. In this capacity, he was named Business Journalist of the Year in 2005 and 2006. Rakesh Kurana, Professor of Leadership Development at the Harvard Business School, a contributor to several journals and newspapers such as Fortune, The New York Times, Washington Post, uh, The Economist, uh, The New Yorker, and the author of uh, From Higher Aims to Hired Hands, The Social Transformation of American Business Schools and the Unfulfilled Promise of Management as a Profession, published by Princeton University Press a few years ago and Nick Lehman, the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University, contributor to the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, the New Yorker, and the author of several books, among which I would like to mention uh, The Big Test, The Secret History of the American Meritocracy, published by Farrar Strauss and Giroux. The moderator is Richard John, professor at the Columbia Journalism School and a core member of the History Faculty at Columbia, where he teaches courses in business history. He's a former uh, president of the uh, Business History Conference and the author of Network Nation, Inventing American Telecommunications, published by Harvard University Press a couple of years ago. And now please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Michele, for the very gracious introduction and for all of your hard work in making this evening's event possible. I'd also like to thank a Columbia history professor and Heyman Center director Mark Mazower for his encouragement and support in getting this project up and running, and to our very distinguished speakers, Martin Dixon, Rakesh Karana, and Nicholas Lemon, for their willingness to share their thoughts on a provocative and challenging uh, subject. I wanted to speak briefly in, in helping to set up the discussion. The Heyman Center, as Michele has reminded us, is intended to provide a forum for discussion of issues that speak to issues of broad cultural import. The recent financial crisis has brought one such issue to the fore, namely the considerable influence that's come to be wielded over the global economy by a constellation of ideas often characterized as neoliberal and that the detractors have been wont to call market fundamentalism. Among these ideas is the deceptively simple proposition that the primary, if, fact, if in fact not the only goal of business management, is the maximization of value of the shares of the enterprises over which business managers preside, a goal that transform managers into agents of the investors who are presumed to be the only relevant stakeholders in the corporate economy. This presumption, like all powerful ideologies, has a history. It would have been rejected out of hand by 19th century political economists. It would have seemed strange, if not bizarre, to business leaders in the United States, as otherwise different as Andrew Carnegie, John Rockefeller, Henry Ford, Alfred Sloan. The maximization of shareholder value was categorically rejected as a corporate goal by the early 20th century managers who built telephone giant American Telephone and Telegraph, 
which by the 1970s would enjoy a brief reign as the largest corporation in the world. And this idea had little place in the intellectual firmament of the academics who staffed the nation's first university-based business schools. Yet, this ideology would come by 2008, financial crisis to exert an enormous influence not only on the pedagogy of many of the nation, if not all of the nation's most prestigious business schools, but also, as Rakesh Karana has posited in his own scholarship, uh, also on the discipline of economics and the promulgation of public policy, in part because of its influence within business schools. In fact, it was in part because of this influence, Karana has contended, that the economics profession would come the second half of the 20th century to abandon the commitment of its founder's generation to the public good, become the value-neutral science led by narrowly trained technocratic adepts who helped to invent the dubious financial practices that would come to imperil the global economy. Since 2008, a great deal has been written in the press about the financial crisis. Financial Times reporter Gillian Tett won broad acclaim for her incisive coverage of the dubious practices of leading Wall Street investment firms. She reached a broad general audience with Fool's Gold, a lively, anthropologically informed tour of the culture of Wall Street that she published in 2009. And in 2010, following year, documentary filmmaker Charles Ferguson won an Academy Award for Inside Job, a riveting expose of the recent economic collapse that featured, as those of you who have seen it will probably remember, a series of rather distinctly unflattering interviews with prominent business school faculty members, interviews that left the impression that the personal self-interest of entrepreneurially-minded academics had played some role in the financial meltdown. Now, our forum today is informed by these recent events. Yet, we seek to explore a dimension of this story that, with the possible exception of a few publications, such as the Financial Times, a story that was not particularly well handled before the fact by journalists, and that within the academy has been confined mostly to highly specialized scholarly journals. In other words, this is not a story that is as well known as it ought to be. And this story is the extent to which the pedagogy of the nation's leading business schools, and in particular, the un inculcation year after year, MBAs, of a profit-maximizing investor-oriented dogma that restricts the moral vis vision of business to a narrow range of economic criteria, the extent to which this dogma is compatible with the humanistic ideals that arguably remain at the core of the modern university, not to mention the civic ideals necessary to sustain the public good. Rakesh Kurana, our first speaker, a sociologist who's written widely and very well on the rise and fall of the professional ideal in the business school pedagogy. Business schools, he's contended, have an obligation to instill in graduates a professional identity that will infuse their business career and not merely their post-career philanthropic efforts. Our second speaker, Martin Dixon, is the, is the managing editor of the United States of one of the world's great financial publications, the Financial Times, a publication that in addition, in addition to a long history of distinguished reporting on global business, has sponsored a talented team of editorialists who have written widely and often critically on financial affairs. Nick Lemon, our final speaker, has covered national politics extensively for many years, with his recent publications, including a much-discussed pre-election profile in The New Yorker of Mitt Romney that included a penetrating discussion of the influence on Romney, the candidate, of the business education that Romney received as a Harvard MBA. And as the dean of a journalism school, he can perhaps provide a perspective on the challenge of instilling a professional identity in another group of technically proficient specialists, that is, journalists, an identity whose education has also been entrusted, or whose education has also been entrusted to the university. So there's some parallels between, perhaps, between business and journalism. Like so many uh, business uh, deans, uh, Nick uh, also has struggled with the challenge of presiding over an institution that is sometimes regarded by other academic units as a mere trade school with an uncertain relationship to the wider mission of the university. Now, business schools are not alone responsible for the recent financialization of the economy, and this financialization being a transformation that would have astonished not only the founders of the republic, but also business leaders from Carnegie, Rockefeller, Ford, Sloan. Yet, if the university in the 21st century 
is to be more than an investment firm with a tax exemption, as cynics have proposed, and in particular, if the university is to remain a center for humanistic inquiry, then it would seem advisable for business school pedagogy to incorporate the perspective of disciplines other than economics, sociology, anthropology, history come to mind, and also to position itself, following the lead perhaps of the most visionary of our law schools, as generators not only of instrumental, but also of humanistic knowledge. And in doing so, business schools might establish themselves as perhaps they were, if you read Rakesh Karana's work in the beginning, as the molders of professionals whose self-identity is capacious enough to embrace criteria other than the bottom line. Now, this is perhaps a tall order, but after all, the humanities are a realm in which the imagination has a license to explore, and this, we have the opportunity this evening to harness the insights, remarkable, the accomplished individuals from various perspectives, to help frame a discussion that might just provide useful in reforming an institution, that is the university-based business school, that has become such a consequential actor in the affairs not only of our nation but of the world. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Rakesh Karana. Okay, um, thank you. Um so John, uh, that was a great intro. I'm not sure I actually have much to say now. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so forgive me. Um, but um, I, I really appreciate being invited to uh, join this panel and really honored to be here with uh, both individuals on this panel as well as you whose work I've read and cited many times. And also I want to um, just in uh, anticipation of my remarks thank my various collaborators, um, J.C. Spender, Marianne Forcard grenache Scott Snook on whose ideas um, I'll draw upon from my remarks. Um, uh, so, you know, this is an interesting time to have this discussion. Um, it's an interesting moment. Uh, questions about the future of business education are happening at the same time that many of our top business schools in the United States just celebrated important milestones. So in 2006, for instance, the Wharton School uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, the first university-based business school, observed the 125th anniversary of its founding in 1881. And in 2008, Harvard Business School celebrated its 100th birthday. Um, these anniversaries and others had actually up to that time had been prompting much celebration and self-congratulatory words. Uh, but you couldn't create a more ironic scene than that which took place on October 21st, 2008, during which the world stock markets were melting down as a consequence of the orgy of speculation and the masters of the universe like J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon, Rick Wagner of General Motors, and Jeffrey Melt of General Electric rushed back on their corporate jets from Washington, D.C., where they had just begged for TARP money and then returned that evening under the soaring tents of HBS, Harvard Business School, amidst a continuous flow of, some of, uh, of champagne, uh, ice sculptures, and a gigantic cake that's the size of this table model in, on Baker Library um, and to celebrate the centennial of the citadel of capitalism. So, um, However, I think in the wake of the greatest economic meltdown since the Great Depression, um, a meltdown that did not emanate, I think, like many other types of economic recessions from a natural catastrophe or a political event, but was actually generated by the actions and the interests of its own graduates. These anniversaries, along with a subsequent decline, actually, in full-time MBA applications, questions about the quality and the um, usefulness of faculty research and student motivations have prompted in the last couple of years some serious reconsideration of these schools' point of arrival. And as this panel is convening about you know, the future around the question of why should universities have business schools. So for those of you who are not familiar with the contemporary American business school, much less with its history, uh, the question may seem akin to why asking like, why universities have deans. Um, yeah, no why do they? Uh, or dining <laughs> halls or development offices. Hasn't it always just been this way? Or if not, why would we now want to do without these things? Because in many ways, the university-based business school is one of the great success stories of American education. Uh, today, there are over 120,000 MBA degrees awarded annually, more than double the number in 1981. Um, once an almost exclusively American phenomena, uh, with less than uh, 2,000 granted in 1950, the MBA degree now um, is uh, granted in more than 100 countries and really has become a globalized credential. Um, the expansion of university business education has been driven to a great extent uh, by the rewards which it provides. Um, an MBA from an elite business school has basically become a golden parachute for some of the most, a uh, golden, I should be careful how I use that word, a golden 
passport um, for one of the most coveted and best paid, paid jobs in, in fields like consulting, investment banking, private equity, and hedge funds. And meanwhile, business school professors and deans not only publish in uh, respected academic journals, but they also sit on corporate boards, serve as well-paid consultants, and dispense valued insights in the media, and occasionally, as you mentioned, show up in Oscar-winning documentaries like The Inside Job. Um, their activities are increasingly underwritten by well-regarded philanthropists like Eli Broad and Michael Bloomberg, who give generously to business schools for facilities, endowed chairs, and student scholarships. In short, business schools are as solid and respectable a presence on their campus as are the Gothic administration buildings or state-of-the-art sports complexes. Why are there business schools in the universities? One might as well wonder why is the Taj Mahal has a dome or why someone hired a sculptor to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It just is. Um, but the reality is that the recent rash of corporate scandals has sparked an important debate about the process by which we produce business leaders. And for those of us who, you know, love business, like myself, and teach in business schools, the unprincipled behavior of some of our former students and the unprincipled actions of their employers like Enron, Merrill Lynch, or McKinsey has been particularly troublesome and raised some questions for us about how well we prepared them for their roles as leaders in society. And for others, particularly CEOs and board members, the lack of connection to pay to performance, um, transactional connections to their companies, and outright greed exhibited by so many senior executives, most recently Daniel Vassell of Novartis, a Harvard Business School advanced management uh, program graduate who earned several hundred million dollars during his tenure as the CEO of this pharmaceutical company, and then three weeks ago demanded $85 million of blackmail money in order not to reveal confidential business plans of the company, um, has caused us to reconsider for a moment the qualities that we look for in business leaders and how to cultivate and screen for them. And as a result, I think uh, we're all involved in the process um, of facing a rare window of opportunity. Society's holding up a mirror in front of us. Um, and so I'd like to use my few minutes uh, this evening uh, to add to the growing course of voices, like those of my fellow panelists, that really want to look at a more systematic and nuanced explanation for our current phenomena. And I think, I think it's in, in consistent with the sort of series that you're putting on here. Um, business schools, I believe, have had a really powerful and underappreciated role in shaping the intellectual filters of economic elites, in influencing what they come to see as natural or regard as common sense. Business schools are where many of society's business leaders learn capitalism. Um, in focusing on business schools, I want to make two claims about what I think will be helpful. The first is that I want to use kind of an institutional analysis of the sort described by um, sociologists like Paul DiMaggio or Woody Powell and John Meyer or anthropologists in which I want to sort of understand the sort of institutional context where their ideas come. And here the starting point is really the professional formation of core ideas that are taught in business schools that operate as a constitutive and directive environment for business enterprises, groups, and individuals. And I want to suggest that the shareholder maximization model, Professor John alluded to earlier, that emerged out of the 1970s has played an astonishingly authoritative role in shaping business school education over the past three decades. And this shareholder maximization model has effectively displaced the inchoate but once relevant notion of management as a profession and corporations as institutions that have explicit obligations to societies in which they're embedded. The second conceptual foray I want to make operates at the level of the identity construction of our business leaders from the recent past and the present and its implications for the future. And this approach is not only about how trend-setting schools like Harvard or Stanford or Chicago or Columbia give their students a general conceptual framework for making sense of business, but also how students who unreflectively adopt these frameworks or knowledge use them to inform their own identities about their role as future business leaders. At stake, I think, are the identities of these individuals, the goals and the purposes they adopt, and the means they employ, and the causal logic that they use to orient means to goals and purposes. So the main one I want to talk about is something called principal agency theory, and it's linked to the shareholder maximization model. If you read the business school literature, several scholars in recent years have voiced their concerns that the dominant human behavior model taught to business school students contributes to the diffusion of practices that actually obliterate good management practices. In the mid-1980s, for example, McGill's Henry Mintzberg argued that business school teachings were increasingly socializing students with an ethic of selfishness and limited accountability with respect to their role in managing their enterprises. Following the Enron and Tyco scandals of 2000, Yale economist Robert Schiller wrote that much of the economic and finance theory that students learn in business schools is not only empirically flawed, such as the perfect um, market hypothesis, but also that students, it actually impairs students' ability uh, to think ethically, that it leads to an ethical disconnect. Um, the courses, he wrote, 
encourage a view of human nature that does not inspire high-mindedness, end quote. And around the same time, the late Sumatra Goshal published the first thorough analysis connecting business education teachings to managerial behavior. And Goshal argued that the contemporary business school curriculum and business school professors were directly contributing to the diffusion of many questionable managerial practices, including excessive executive compensation and ethical shortcuts. Goshal wrote, and I quote, business schools do not need to do a great deal more to pre help prevent future Enrons. They need only to stop doing what they currently do. They do not need to create new courses. They need to simply stop teaching some old ones. Business school faculty need to own up to their own role in creating Enrons. Our theories and ideas have done much to strengthen the management practices that we are now so loudly condemning. The interesting thing is that even though we had Enron, it didn't actually change anything in business schools. It set us up in many ways for the next crisis. Well, one of the dominant theories that Goshal was referring to that really does connect to the subsequent financial crisis falls within the rubric of what we call principal agency theory, which is an economic model of the firm that offers a fairly general conceptual framework for bringing together previously disparate fields like accounting, strategy, finance, and organizational behavior, something business education actually sorely had been lacking, some real body of knowledge or general theory. In a series of papers, the economist Michael Jensen and several of his colleagues at the University of Rochester and the University of Chicago proposed a theoretical roadmap that forcefully asserted that the sole purpose of the corporation was to maximize shareholder value, and that since managers have self-regarding motives that differ from those stockholders, monitoring these managers under conditions of wide stock dispersal is a real challenge. And they argue that because managers' efforts are not easily observable, managers will basically fail to work towards stockholder goals. And the challenge then is to align their incentives in which their personal financial interests come into close kind of parallel or correspondence with those of the owners. Essentially what Jensen and what Meckling and Eugene Fama, who were basically the authors of this school, emphasized three mechanisms. Monitoring managerial performance, providing comprehensive economic incentives, and promoting an active market of takeovers, or what they called the market for corporate control. Monitoring managerial behavior involved employing, you know, complex accounting practices and the appointment of a professional board of directors. Uh, the alignment of incentives was about remunerating management in the form of stock and stock options so that managers and owners face very similar incentives and therefore self-interested managers will maximize shareholder value as a byproduct of maximizing their own material gain. And then the market for corporate control, which leads to stock prices reflecting firm fundamentals and ensures that poorly performing CEOs or insiders, for example, will be ultimately threatened and replaced by efficiency and profit maximizing outsiders. People like Bill Ackman or Carl Icahn, uh, Henry Kravis, those types of individuals. And principal agency theory had a pretty dramatic impact inside uh, the business school. It created a unified approach to organizations and corporate governance in American business schools, catalyzing academic revolutions in corporate finance, capital markets, organizational behavior, accounting, corporate governance, and the market for corporate control. The theory really spearheaded a new paradigm in management theory and research. And unlike much of the earlier scholarship in business schools, the core ideas of principal agency theory did not emerge from inductive observation and practical experience but instead through the theoretical musings of a newly revitalized neoclassical economic theory. Drawing on the legitimacy of the economics discipline and spurred by its apparent capacity to account for the economic stagnation of the 1970s, principal agency theory quickly reshaped the intellectual life of leading business schools. By the 1980s, this approach had gained the authority to classify managerial action and managerial character. This process was not an innocent academic exercise. The intimate bonding of disciplinary knowledge and its implications for professional identity is a fundamental postulate in the social sciences. Of course, people actively use knowledge to advance their influence and privilege. I don't have to say that here. As people like Michel Foucault noted, the process is more profound since the classification of knowledge grounded in behavioral science creates distinctions that we come to see as natural, thus limiting our thinking by providing scripts and unconscious habits of thought that come to rule over our action. Professional education, especially when it receives reinforcement through the expectations associated with recruitment and promotion, can profoundly shape the way people process information and make sense of the world. What's interesting is that agency theory, in many ways, was an attack on the legitimacy of managerial authority, the idea that managers should run companies. And as university business schools historically had understood it, both during their founding era and amidst the revisions of the post-World War II period. 
Its proponents wish to focus especially on the difficulties that emerge with the dispersal of stock holdings and the rise of management, addressing them by deploying neoclassical economic theory, which conceptualizes the separation of ownership and control as one in which managers have absolutely no interest in recognizing shareholders' interest, except insofar as they are forced to do so by their formal contractual conditions of employment. In other words, managers have to be bribed to do their jobs. It flies in the face of the original social contract between the university and society when it created business schools. Nicholas Murray Butler, president of Columbia University in the, uh, um, at the founding of Columbia's business school said, quote, actually this is his advocacy for why Columbia should have a business school. There is coming to be a philosophy of business just as there has been a philosophy of theology, of law, of medicine, and of teaching. And it's through that door of that philosophy, that understanding of fundamental principles and higher standards, that the university seeks to lead men and women to prepare themselves for the capable and competent pursuit of this form of intellectual activity in public service. But instead, by reducing managers to agents of shareholders and by extension actors who could not be trusted to act in the interest of the firm, the proponents of agency theory removed any notion of considering a manager's actions in terms of transcendental value such as service, duty, or assessing the salience of social checks on narrow self-interest. As Marcel Gauchot put puts it, we are now dealing with, quote, actors who wish to be free from all ties and with nothing above them to hinder the maximization of everything they do, end quote. The notion of a manager's duty to the firm is no longer valid insofar as they're guaranteed by some higher power, either transcendental or ethical. The relationship is only valid because of the direct relationship it has to the manager's pocketbook, wallet, and to the stock price. This approach, of course, means that the only important way to make sense of the manager and the firm is through a relentlessly commodified language and analysis. This radical change in redefining the relationship between managers and firms led to a real normative mutation. Once all the notions of duty or the symbolic duty of the relationship between managers and the firms and the larger society began to disappear, the identity of management itself became transformed. Indeed, the worldview that we teach to MBA students can no longer be the same than when what is at stake in managerial activities is not an attempt to come to terms with notions of managers as professionals who have duties to the firm and its multiple constituents as well as to the broader society, but instead is bound with one's ability to fit in with the never-ending flows of money and trying to maximize shareholder value. Agency theory, in short, self-consciously, through the old notion of management as a profession or the manager as a professional, into the scrap heap of history. And we discovered then, as it was with the case with all far-reaching ideologies unleashed in the 20th century, the new ideology of management wanted nothing less than to create a new type of individual. But unlike the previous ideologies of communism or socialism or fascism, which sought to appeal to an individual's prejudices or communal identities, the great appeal of this ideology, what I call economism, was that it sought to appeal to individual self-interest. And in class after class, business school students were knocked into shape around their narrow short-term self-interest, getting the repeated message that constructing the world on this basis would be the best long-term interest of the firm, its immediate constituents, and the world more generally. Indeed, an Aspen Institute study which followed 3,000 MBA students found that when MBA students first came into business schools, they believed the purpose of business was to develop useful products and services. When they left business schools, they believed the purpose was to maximize shareholder value. So, in fact, to conclude my comments with respect to the context and the legitimacy of the free enterprise system, I'd like to put forth that argument that this intellectual framework, which forms the core underpinnings of contemporary business education, has really corroded the character and transformed the identity of managers and businesses in a profound way. More than 30 years ago, the late sociologist Robert Nisbet described the emergence of a particular character type that he said was beginning to dominate the leadership of our basic social institutions, our political, economic, and civic institutions. Building on Samuel Johnson's description of an unconstrained individual who hangs like a parasite hung loose upon society, Nisbet called this character type the loose individual. The loose individual, Nisbet argued, does not feel constrained by norms arising from social values such as fairness or equity. The loose individual does not believe in allegiances to social institutions such as nations, firms, or even occupations. Loose individuals, Nisbet says, lack any sense of moral responsibility, often, quote, playing fast and loose with the other individuals in relationships of trust and responsibility, end quote. Outside of their intimates, the relations with others are transactional, anchored only in self-interest. I think the economic collapse and now the almost decade-long sordid revelations around executive comp, golden parachutes, unearned bonuses, misleading financial statements makes it clear that the loose individual, once associated with confidence games and running the local numbers racket in Queens, now dominates the inner sanctum of capitalist activities. 
whether on Wall Street or in the executive suites and boardrooms. I grew up in Queens, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> the loose, loose individual has radically reconfigured the financial governance and technical apparatus of American comp capitalism. And I obviously understand there's lots of structural factors that contribute to this, you know, poorly designed governance systems. But I want to share something with you that I think gives a kind of, a, you know, kind of more salient example. So about five years ago, some graduating MBA students voluntarily created this Hippocratic Oath for management to put management on a more ethical footing and oriented toward creating long-term sustainable value for society. And this happened in the wake of the financial crisis. It turned out this was quite a contentious issue among our students. So the oath was... As a manager, my purpose is to serve the greater good by bringing together people and resources to create value that no single individual can build alone. Therefore, I seek a course that enhances the value my enterprise can create over society for the long term, and I recognize that my decisions will have far-reaching consequences. And basically ask people to report their finances honestly, to act with integrity, and to do things in good faith. What seemed like innocuous language, actually, turns out our second-year student basically found it to be quite offensive. He said... And he was pretty emblematic of most of the students, which is most worrisome about this oath is what first seems like innocuous language and progressive thinking is really the failed ideologies of history masquerading as enlightenment. Signatories must forswear decisions and behavior that advance my own narrow ambitions but harm the enterprise and the societies it serves. Contrary to fundamental economics, this implies that pursuit of self-interest does not serve the greater good and that the aims of the individual are subservient to the indeterminable goals of society. MBAs must also promise to create sustainable economic, social, and environmental prosperity worldwide. One is not simply to preserve the environment, but to create benefits of, of, for it. Of course, sustainability in its modern form is invariably code for a wealth transfer from shareholder to third parties. All popular prescriptions for social and environmental progress are inevitably the same socialism. Now, I would sort of question the student's understanding of economics, but I think fairly what's interesting is that, you know, I'll go back to Dan Vesela, who actually was a trained physician, um, the CEO of Novartis, who was negotiating this exit package at his company in order to keep him from selling his knowledge about the company's trade secrets to the highest bidder. In a mercenary logic, he defended his stance saying, quote, it has been very important to Novartis that I refrain from making my knowledge and know-how available to competitors and to take advantage of my experience with the company. In return, the Novartis board of directors agreed to make annual payments according to a fair market value provided I fulfill all my obligations. This from a man who had already received over $200 million from Novartis. I think what we see here, both in the students and Vesela's account, is the sociocultural linkage of knowledge and behavior that can turn on the relationship between individual learning and social identity. Learning is not only part of the acquisition of knowledge, but it's also part of the acquisition of identity, particularly in professional schools. People don't simply learn about, they also learn to be. I am not against profit. In fact, I consider myself a private in the capitalist army. Um, but I think profit's only useful if it actually connects and becomes a means toward an end both in terms of guidance on how to produce it and how to make good use of it. If profit becomes the only imperative it, without concern for how it's produced, the negative externalities, environment, child labor, without any sense of the common good as its ultimate end, it actually will likely destroy the economic and social value and create poverty, the thing that it was actually designed to alleviate. The bigger worry that I have is that now, rather than drawing its legitimacy from the university as it did during their founding 100 years ago, universities are actually adopting the playbook of business schools. Um, universities are facing tremendous financial and legitimacy pressures and increasingly copying the kind of perpetual capital campaign, superstar salaries, close corporate relationships that basically business schools essentially modeled. Um, and I think the danger is that it becomes like too many business schools, a fawning handmaiden to corporate and college recruiters, little more. Meanwhile, inside business schools, the imperative of creating management as a profession has totally dissolved. It's been replaced by a conspiracy of silence, a kind of omerta that exists between corporate recruiters who value the MBA process as a screen, a test of personal initiative, self-selection, uh, cultural capital, um, you know, intelligence, but they don't actually expect any content. Right? It's sort of like you don't need, you just sort of select people in medical school before they've gone through any training. And B-schools who live in a state of existential tension with the rest of the university, but which is largely palliated by money, money, and money. And the same kind of reputational impacts that I think that we have just seen recently at Penn State, or the cheating and unfolding email hacking at my own institution, which some say was more motivated by protecting NCAA eligibility rules rather than the educational imperative. Um, you know, my sense to the answer to this question, again, it's more meant to be a 
I don't, I don't want to make this a closing argument, but just to raise some questions, maybe real universities don't need either sports teams or B schools as they're currently constituted. So. Okay. Thank you. We've experimented with the latter proposition here at Columbia, but not the former. <laughs> <laughs> the football team? Yeah. <laughs> you just lose a lot of games yes. this way. Yes, you do. Good. Um, is the microphone okay? Can you? Yeah, it's okay. Good. Um, uh, thank you very much, Rakesh. Uh, that was fascinating. Uh, I am coming at the argument from a completely different perspective, but I think I may end up at the same position from that very different perspective, which is to question whether business schools belong within a university context. Um, the formal title of the discussion is should business schools have a future and if that should implies uh, a moral imperative behind business schools I would question uh, whether that's the question we should be asking uh, are business schools a place where we inculcate academic values I'm not so sure um, are they a place where one educates business people uh, to help society and to create wealth? Uh, yes, I would say they are. But I would like to look at this argument from the perspective, since we're in a market economy, the perspective of the customer, the individual student who is going to a business school, and ask, uh, is this a product I want in the light of all that's happened in 2008 and since? and other changes in the economy and the way society uh, looks at business people. And I think there are three, question, three core questions people will ask as they're debating whether they want to go to business school. First, what will I learn here that gives me new knowledge to help me do my job better? What will I learn here that develops me as a human being, as a manager, a leader, and as a member of society? And thirdly, who will I meet here with whom I will be able to network to mutual benefit? The second set of questions, I think, is around money. And um, Rakesh has spoken of narrow self-interest. Uh, I tend to take a rather Hobbesian view of human nature that um, we are primarily motivated by self-interest, and to ignore that um, is to ignore a key motivating factor. And the question people will ask about business schools in relation to money, is this a product I can afford? In other words, will the lifetime salary uplift I get from this course handsomely offset the costs I incur in doing the course? And if the answer to both of those is yes, it leads on to a third set of questions, which is, in the age of the internet, are there actually much cheaper disruptive alternatives that give me as good a, a result as going to business school. So what would our sensible, self-interested, potential customer of a business school answer to all these questions? First, curriculum. Um, business schools, as Rakesh has said, has faced a lot of criticism and hang-wringing about their performance before, during, and around the financial crisis. And I would agree with pretty well all those. First of all, there was a failure to spot that uh, there were huge imbalances in, in the financial system. There was a failure to uh, ad adequately measure risk and realize that risks in the system were wildly skewed. And there was a major contribution to creating the crisis through the focus on shareholder value, uh, which encourages short-termism. And this, again, f came very much out of the business schools in the 1970s, and in particular, uh, Michael Jensen, although I thought he was associated with Harvard. He, he did. He went okay. from Rochester to Harvard. To Harvard, yeah. So I don't know at which point he... Anyway. <laughs> that was the diffusion. Harvard. That was, yeah, I don't know. We... We own him. <laughs> you, you, you accepted him. Um, the, um, uh, 
the, the focus on shareholder value has created a very narrow mindset, uh, encouraged short-termism, and linked to that the, the belief that share options or restricted shares are the way to motivate management uh, when you have a principal agent problem and that um, that's all you have to focus on. That's, that's the key determinant of behaviour. Um, and also the belief that, which again you alluded to, that markets are efficient, that everything we know is reflected in the price of uh, uh, an entity and that uh, that price is um, a fair and reasonable one, whereas in fact, as this market crisis showed in 2008 and the dot-com crisis of 2000 showed, um, markets are very far from being efficient. They, they may be partially efficient, but there, are, there is huge scope for collective uh, il illusion uh, that will take markets off on a, on a wild um, uh, f flight that loses all touch with, with rationality. Um, there also, in business schools, has been remarkably little focus until very recently on behavioral economics, uh, which again helps explain why these market madnesses occur. It's herd mentality. It's back to Gillian Tett's anthropological view of Wall Street, uh, the, idea that, the idea that humans are rational in their decision-making um, is disproved by behavioral economics. And there's all, there was also, in the run-up to that, this crisis and indeed other crises, far little to emphasis on economic history, and in particular the economic history of financial bubbles. Um, there's a fairly uh, uh, fixed pattern in human nature that as soon as the last person who remembers the last crisis has retired, we're on track for a new crisis. And if business schools had paid more attention to the history of the last 100 years in terms of financial booms and busts, uh, we might have had a lot more caution leading up to the crisis. Um, but are these, are these manifold failures sufficient for our intelli intelligent student to turn their back on business school and say, this has no value for me uh, or for society? Um, I would argue not, up to a point. Um, first of all, business schools were hardly alone in missing the risks that um, led to the 2007-2008 financial crisis. Entire conventional orthodoxy failed, r running from the Federal Reserve through the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, uh, to the entire, or most of the, the brains on Wall Street, uh, to economics departments, to business schools. There was a a, a collective uh, failure to recognise that the system was completely out of balance. And this, you know, not, not to leave journalists out of it, this was largely the case uh, among journalists as well, with one or two honourable exceptions. Gillian Tett, who you mentioned, was one of them who warned of um, the dangers of uh, financial instruments that um, were extremely complex and opaque years before it happened, and one of the main economists at the IMF uh, made similar warnings. But on balance, this was a systemic failure rather than simply a business school failure. Did business schools play a major part in, in creating that environment? Yes, they did. But so did um, economics faculties of the major universities around the world. Um, where uh, should business schools be be placing their emphasis now in terms of changes to the curriculum. Um, well, the role of the um, public area, in rather, as opposed to simply the private area, uh, in in um, the development of business and in relations between business and government. Uh, uh, we have already had allusions to the heads of GM and Ford and Chrysler uh, rushing to the government for assistance. Uh, 
the bailout of the banks is another example where the, the private markets failed and required government intervention. Clearly, there is far more um, involvement between those two parties than business schools have liked to recognize before uh, with their shareholder value proposition. The, the fact is that um, if you have institutions that are too big to fail, then shareholder value doesn't get you very far because the managers of those companies know that at the end of the day there is a potential taxpayer bailout for their errors. Um, and there should be far much more emphasis, I think, on corporate reputation and how easy that is to lose. Um, but realistically, if I was a student and uh, I was looking at business schools and thinking uh, my future career is going to be in a large corporate structure, um, will business schools potentially give me the advantages I need in terms of the curriculum with those changes? Yes, yes, I think they probably would. Um, where I would very much doubt the value of the curriculum is if I was a entrepreneur or a contrarian money market manager. Because one has to ask to what extent business schools actually encourage groupthink that uh, goes with a large corporate flow or whether they encourage out-of-the-box thinking, up-to-date, cutting-edge thinking, and, and in particular where broader society is going. Business ethics uh, traditionally uh, in business schools were hardly taught at all until the Enron crisis, uh, study of ethics was often optional. And even now, when business, business ethics is taught, it's often taught as a separate module rather than being integrated into the course subject as a whole. Business schools uh, have also been incredibly slow to emphasize corporate governance as an important theme. Uh, I remember back, I think it was in the early years of, of this century, Bob Monks, who, is, who has campaigned uh, for better corporate governance for 20, 30 years, um, endowed a chair at my alma mater, Cambridge, at the Judge School of Management in the UK. And uh, this was regarded as a, a remarkable, uh, unusual thing to do. Business schools were just not interested in corporate social responsibility, which since Enron and since 2008 has come to play a central role in thinking about business and its broader role in society. Thirdly, um, business schools, I don't think, uh, and particularly in this country, I'd say, are not nearly as global in their thinking as they could be, certainly historically and even today. Um, I think it's qu quite remarkable that Harvard Business School, which supposedly runs uh, a global course, uh, their, their latest annual report shows that 65% of all the cases they teach in the core program are about U.S. companies and institutions rather than, than the wider world. Um, the second criteria, if I was a student looking at business schools, would be, as I said, to what extent does this develop me as a leader, as a manager, as a human being, and to a very important extent, what extent do business schools inculcate management skills and awareness awareness of other people and leadership skills in the sense of creating a corporate culture and getting feed in into it and, and employing modern leadership techniques. Um, I don't think they do a particularly good job of this. I think business school attitudes towards leadership skills tend towards the, the academic rather than the practical. And I think the greater the practical of, the practical approach towards these issues, uh, the greater the strength of business school and the, the more value that both the individual and society will get out of them. Third element is, is costs and to what extent business schools provide value for money. And I think there's an increasing question mark the extent to which they do. Fees at business schools have been rising at 7% a year 
uh, MBA students who enrolled in 2012 paid 62% more in fees than those who began in 2005. And if one is taking a narrow Hobbesian view, uh, students on top US MBA programs in the 1990s saw their salaries triple in five years. In recent years, they've seen half that. So all these factors make you think if someone is interested in studying business, and the fact is we need businesses and we need business leaders, do you look at lower cost alternatives that are starting to be out there? Um, the internet provides opportunities for traditional business schools, but also a threat from new, in, in, new entrants, disruptive companies breaking the mold with a lot lower costs. This is the age of massive open online courses where students can mix and match. They can get a business education without necessarily going on a two-year MBA. There are business schools which have started to run online MBAs. And in terms of the curriculum, a lot of what you learn can be done elsewhere. What about these softer skills? What I think it's harder to do online is teach the soft skills that business schools could really uh, provide real value with in terms of student interaction, workshops, experimentation, leadership, and approaches to broader societal issues than have traditionally been in the past. So while I think top business schools, such as Harvard and Columbia, uh, are likely to be with us for a long time to come. The second tier, I think, really has to think uh, about emphasizing these terribly soft and important skills if they're going to have uh, a, a long-term future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so thanks everybody, and I'll, I'll uh, try to kind of race through this so we can have more time for interaction. Um, first, I want to say a few things from the point of view of a professional school dean, even though I'm a dean of a very profoundly different kind of professional school. Essentially, Rakesh, our school is what you wish Harvard Business School were. And uh, to the point that many have accused us and our kind of actually uh, creating firms that are so attuned to virtue that they're going out of business. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not kidding, really. And, and you know, Mr. Uh, our school was is now in its centennial. Uh, we tried to model it on the Harvard Business School centennial, uh, but discovered after doing some research that your dean went to something like 47 countries in one year. Um, and I told my wife that that was what the Harvard Business School dean had done, and so we, we had a lower to the ground centennial here. Um, but when Mr. Pulitzer endowed our school, he rather grandly declared, well, you should read, Rakesh, if you haven't, his sort of statement about what, the, what he wanted the school to be. It's very interesting from your perspective for a couple of reasons. First, uh, and this will get... I'll, I'll segue into business school. He came to Columbia starting in the early 1890s and said, I propose that, uh, to endow a journalism school and a, and a set of prizes for journalists here. The university's instant reaction was, well, why would we ever want to do that? What has any journalist done that deserves a prize? And what, what is there to teach a journalist in the university? It was seen as a skilled trade. Um, so it would be like saying I want to start a school of printing or something like a setting linotype in a, in a university. Uh, he persisted. Um, there was a moment uh, which we at Columbia don't remember when uh, Nicholas Murray Butler was a young man and had just been made president of uh, Columbia. And at that moment, Mr. Pulitzer came back um, and offered the gift again, this time saying, if I don't give it to you, I'll give it to Harvard. And, uh, and that changed Columbia's mind. <laughs> when it was announced, um, there was a storm of protest from journalists, uh, essentially saying in the uh, latter-day words of the Pink Floyd song, we don't need no education. <laughs> and 
Uh, so Mr. Pulitzer felt he had to defend himself. So he wrote this wonderful essay a year after endowing the school called The School of Journalism. And in that essay, he rather grandly declares, never will students in my school be taught anything about either the practical sort of technology and production side of journalism or about the economic basis of journalism because that will sully them and they must only learn about the most elevated social mission of journalism. And so it was until very recently and since in, in, in response to what's going on now, we've actually started requiring all of our students to take the history of journalism, the business side of journalism, and lots of things about the, the links between journalism and technology of production, particularly computer science. Uh, nonetheless, our, no one would ever accuse um, our school, our peer institutions, or uh, our students, either as students collectively or as alumni, of uh, uh, ruining the country or the world through their excessive commercial values. Um, but uh, there still are some similarities that I want to talk about between us and business schools. Um, we are unlicensed professions. Um, there's a, there's so, a series of, uh, of professional schools here at Columbia that, that feed into unlicensed professions. The School of Public Affairs right over there is another one. Um, these are fields where you know, many prominent people in the field have the degree and many prominent people in the field don't have the degree. Um, so you don't have to, in this sort of tautological sense created by licensing regimes, go to the professional school to be in the profession. Um, so this puts pressure on, on the school to justify itself. Um, Bill Gates didn't go to business school. But Steve Ballmer did go to business school. So what, why did Bill Gates hire Steve Ballmer? You know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg didn't go to business school, but Sheryl Sandberg did go to business school. There's this kind of mix among the business, uh, prominent business people between people who went and people who didn't go. So the two fundamental questions is for any professional school, but particularly an unlicensed professional school, are one, what do you do to k persuade people to pay you a lot of money and a lot of the time of their lives uh, uh, to get into a profession that they don't, strictly speaking, that they can get into without going to your school? And, and that's a very interesting series of questions. Um, in, a, in effect, there's three possible answers. This echoes Martin's list. One is... Uh, a selection effect, the, the, the mere act of being selected by Columbia Business School, Harvard Business School, is basically the, the deal is done right there because, because of the value of the credential. Second is the network effect, that is you meet the other students, you meet alums, you, the career service office is, is filled with recruiters and, and it's, it's those opportunities that you're really paying for. And the third, which we professional educators hope is the most important and may not be to the minds of students is what we actually teach you in the school um, is, is what makes all the difference. And it's very hard to pull those three apart and no professional school would ever want to try because it's too scary you know, to find out the answer. Um, so that's kind of one set of pressures. A second set of pressures, because we live in research universities, is and this is what you know prospective students in the public don't doesn't under, don't understand so well is the question to faculty what the hell are you doing here if you're not a scholar universities research universities were created to uh, be a home to scholars and are you one and if you're not why not and this has been and you pointed this out very well in in, in your book uh, um, on business school education, this is a persistent problem for, let's say, journalism schools, business schools, public policy schools. In the first instance, they tend to hire retired practitioners. Uh, in, in the early days of business school, the person who ran the plant for Union Carbide and the person who was the brand manager for Procter & Gamble, and, and they want to, quote, give back and they're, you know, in their late 50s, early 60s, they come to the school, they kind of 
tell war stories about their career. They tell students what's it like out there. They try to replicate within the school the experience of actually being a manager in a business. And, and um, often this is quite popular with students. Our version of it is, you know, ex-journalists uh, teaching you the mores of the newsroom. And then what happens, as you know, is... Uh, the provost of the university sort of said, and, and in much of the rest of the university says, what the hell is going on here? You know, these people are not publishing scholarly work. They don't have scholarly credentials. Who are they exactly? And then that leads to um, a pressure on these schools to sort of grow up and invent a version of genuine academe for themselves. So I believe it's true that the most prestigious law school, uh, Yale Law School, has not a single faculty member who's ever been on the payroll of a law firm for a year. Um, in other words, and, and I'm not saying that is a bad thing necessarily, although the public doesn't quite get that, but th there's a, a tendency or a pressure from within the university to establish a, a, a career track for faculty in the professional schools that is distinct from the career track in the profession itself. And then you sort of, and, and that involves publication that at least feels scholarly. So then the question is, what is that exactly? And, and there are lots and lots of answers. One for business schools is, is um, hiring economists. Um, I'm curious what percent of the HBS faculty have MBAs. Um, very small. Yeah. So you have you have the the specter of or the reality of professional schools. This would be true here at Columbia at SEPA, the public affairs school, the public health school, of of students being trained to a degree by professors who don't have the degree they're training the students to. Um, the argument against that is is uh, that that. Uh, you know, if you're an economist and you couldn't get tenure in the economics department, arts and sciences, then you go to the business school or to the public affairs school. So there's this whole argument around that. And is there a distinctive branch of economics that belongs in business schools and not in economics departments? So that's a whole debate that's kind of invisible to students and the public. And then, you know, particularly at HBS, there's the, the development of uh, a, a distinct curriculum that um, in, in, in Harvard Business School's case, the, the, the case method stuff and all the case production, that is a form of publication that, that into which great effort goes, both in terms of producing them and the pedagogical methods associated with them, and, and allows the school to say, this is what we do while the people in arts and sciences publish in scholarly journals. But there's a lot of making fun of that, as you know, in the academy as well. And, and, and there's a whole fight between HBS and places like Chicago over how serious is the case method really and how much is it just gussied up war stories. So all these questions are very hard to answer. That's by way of prelude to saying, I think that partly explains both factors, what the, the student looking for the value proposition and the faculty looking for a, a, a definition of research I would offer the hypothesis, at least, that those two factors caused uh, principal agent theory to sort of pop. Because, first, as you pointed out, it, it comes across as a business school resident, distinct, business school born, distinct body of research that has real intellectual value uh, that isn't just imported from another realm. You know, if you read the first Jensen Meckling paper, it has all these formulas all over the place, and no one can say, oh, these guys are just, you know, telling war stories. Um, so so that's, that's one thing, that it, it meets that need. On the other side, it, it, it helps create an ecosystem where the students actually don't want to become managers. They want to become uh, consultants and, and 
financial advisors and, and you know, it's the, what in my Romney article I call the transition from the organization man to the transaction man. So then, you know, the, the, the argument to the student is you're actually not learning to be a manager and you're not going to be a chump who starts as a junior brand manager at P&G, uh, you know, running the Febreze account or something. You're going to get to go straight to Wall Street or straight to McKinsey or straight to BCG and kind of jump the queue and, and, and get into these fields. So almost by way of explanation, I would say it's, it's not just about sort of moral rot, as you sometimes uh, hint, but, but it's, it's about uh, creating a, a sort of ecosystem that meets a couple of sets of needs that works. And then once it's set off, of course, it, it really takes off and, and, and it becomes this sort of thing powering uh, business schools. Um, second thing is just to talk a little more about, about principal agent theory in, in, a, in a wider context. Um, I, I've recently uh, uh, kind of gotten to be buddies with Michael Jensen because I, I got very intrigued with him when I was working on Romney and I've had several long conversations with him lately. He's like a lot of uh, uh, figures you meet in intellectual life. He's, he's all about, no one understands my ideas, um, and they've been misused um, and misapplied. Uh, in particular, he insists that um, uh, he doesn't believe in maximizing shareholder value. He believes in maximizing company value. And he says, that's the fundamental thing no one understands about me, and they're completely different. And all the people who thought I was talking about shareholder value went off and did all these horrible things that I did not intend, so for what it's worth. Um, but I, I think it's, a, it, it's interesting to put principal, or at least I want to propose putting principal agent theory in a wider context. Uh, the wider context starts back in the time after, in wider intellectual context, including on the left. Um, the, the ruling idea that's associated with the heyday of the corporate world that you talk about with some nostalgia um, is of a supremely institution-oriented society and, and a pluralistic society. Um, and those ideals were significantly eroded across the board in intellectual life. Um, you know, the Port Huron statement that founded SDS shows immense dissatisfaction with that. David Reisman's uh, The Lonely Crowd shows immense dissatisfaction. Um, Galbraith's The Affluent Society does. The Early Days of Ralph Nader does. It, it's this picture of a society where there, and Mancure Olson comes to mind as well. It's all these critics across a lot of fields and a lot of ideological positions who say the problem with society is that it isn't pluralistic and organizationally oriented, it's bureaucratic, meant badly, and special interest group oriented. And everything's been sort of gummed up and messed up by the power of these groups and, and, and if only we could uh, be more sort of efficient about meeting social needs, then we'd have a good society. Um, and, and Jensen's theory is, I would argue, on a list of about 10 versions of that. Um, in his case, it's, you know, corporate bureaucracy is screwing the small shareholder, or the big shareholder, or just shareholders. And these, he goes on in this paper, it's this, if you haven't read it, it's wonderful to read, it's this mix of they sit in their walnut-paneled offices, you know, being brought things by their secretaries in shapely miniskirts with these recondite formulas. <laughs> um, but it's this picture of managers as these kind of fattened, fat cats who don't care about anything but themselves and, and, and are, are, are kind of stealing from their shareholders. So, you know, let's get rid of, let's create a, a sort of simple social justice metric, but the social justice is company value. Um, so there's this much broader shift 
from a set of ideals that assume institutions and pluralism are good, the marks of a good society, to assuming that they're the impediments to a good society. And then the question becomes, whose idea about the one social variable to solve for and blow out all the structures to make room for will win? And because of the kind of country we live in, turned out the one about business won. I mean, that's kind of my overall sense of things. But that, having said all that, then the big question, which I'll just raise but not try to answer, is how much purchase can you really get in reversing all these larger social trends just by getting control of the real estate that is elite business students' brains for two years of their lives? Um, I would like to think I'm a professional school dean. I have devoted my life to this. So I'd like to think, um, you know, if you can really get in there and stuff in everything you want to stuff in and the time you have with them, then it's going to be like the Manchurian candidate. And it's just in there and it's not visible to anybody, but they're going to act on it forever. Uh, but I wonder, and I'll, I'll stop just by posing this question, whether in fact you know, the causality has to be reversed, at least to some extent. You have to sort of change larger social assumptions, larger social institutions and, and, and arrangements. And from that, the hearts and minds of business school students w and, and others will follow. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, they took it away. I'll have to stay seated. Um, I'm just going to stand up to sort of be traffic cop. I think instead of posing some questions myself, I'd see if we have any questions uh, from the floor. You can address the question to a, one of our speakers or just ask the question. Try not, at least at the beginning, try not to make a speech. Yes. Uh, to Mr. Dixon, uh, you mentioned the NBA teaching, teaching leadership and maybe that being part of the, uh, the worthwhile aspect of the MBA. Uh, do you really, or Tupac, do you think that leadership can be taught, and that's a more personality trait, that you're going to turn someone that's timid to someone that's outgoing, per se, and does that maybe contribute to some of the moral rot that everyone walks out thinking they're the leader of the pack and the rules don't apply to them? Uh, very good question. I think, I think there are certain innate uh, qual leadership qualities that probably can't be taught, but I, I think a certain amount can be taught, both in terms of... Um, in terms of how a leader relates to other people within an organization. Um, I know from personal experience, I had a business school course on leadership, and uh, it was profoundly useful for me in terms of changing my own behavior and thinking about things I hadn't thought before. So I think it's, um, it's like many things in life. It's part nature, part nurture. Rakesh, you're a professor of leadership, if I recall correctly. Do you want to weigh in on this question? Can leadership be taught? I mean, I think, you know, so the now dean of the business school and I co-authored a book called The Handbook of Leadership Theory and Practice in reaction to my argument that it couldn't be taught. And since he was becoming the dean, <laughs> uh, he decided to figure out if I could write a book about this. Um, we edited a volume. And I think the, the question in many ways is that, you know, there's – if you decompartmentalize leadership, we sort of use this model that was based in one that the military academies do, which is there's knowing, doing, and being. There's sort of a body of knowledge that you expect leaders to have, understanding of group dynamics, understanding of organizational bureaucracies. You know, there's, there's knowledge you can gain from that. There's the doing, which is, you know, just like in any other field, the capacity to take that knowledge, and it's multidisciplinary, but apply it to concrete situations. I think this is where you were going, which is kind of how do you actually put people through experiences in which that knowledge actually gets, <coughs> you know, tried on, and in, in that's kind of low cost. Yeah. In some ways, it, you're not taking it out on shareholders, you're not taking it out on customers, and as you're sort of other people paying the price as you learn leadership. Um, and then there's the identity component, this sort of sense, I think, of what you were saying, the sense of self about you know, on, 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 on leadership. I think that the challenge that we face in business education is that the knowing largely, I think, has been fairly narrow, economistic kind of knowledge. That's sort of been argued to be the base that constituted the fundamental. The doing was largely technical. So it was kind of, you know, um, 
in, in these more transactional situations where they would take summer jobs, most of our students would take summer jobs in which they were basically analysts and financial service firms or you know, uh, consultants. And then the identity was, I think, we were self-selecting students who were probably predisposed to a very utilitarian orientation. That is, they were already coming in kind of thinking about education as a kind of more human capital networking end. And then surrounded by other kind of masters of the universe, kind of undertaking a kind of Nietzsche and Ubermensch heroic project in which they kind of saw that as kind of that's who they were. And they, they think that model of leadership, a charismatic individualistic orientation, while I agree was partly a product of the political kind of context, in many ways, often what professional schools would do is both screen people out for that, medical schools try to avoid yeah. getting people like that, and then in, in their own Manchurian candidate way, when you read the anthropology of medical education, the anthropology of law schools, is actually re-socialize people to think like a doctor, right. act like a doctor. So I think there are potentials for it. The challenge that we face is I think we've almost gone past the tipping point in business education. Uh, a week and a half ago, um, 450 of our second year MBA students like disappeared. They just didn't show up to class out of the 900. Then on Monday, we pick up, where did the students go? They were in Breckenridge on a ski trip. Because what they've largely emphasized is that they think the most important part of education, and I think this is the part that we may not have wanted to take it apart, but the students have taken it apart, <coughs> is the social network, which they actually believe is the primary aspect of education. Now, at one level, that sounds so like depressing. At another level, I'm also a, a master of one of the undergraduate houses at Harvard, that social part's really important, but historically, it's not something we've curated as part of the educational ex experience. And now to go to your earlier point, in the world of MOOCs, all these assets that we have, these physical assets, the multi-billion dollars of real estate Columbia sits on and the you know, expensive real estate we sit on, could become the biggest liabilities we have unless we make the actual face-to-face -face aspect of education that can't be duplicated online. And I think... Now, out of self-interest, that is actually changing the pedagogical model that we're doing in business education, and it's actually very quickly happening at the undergraduate level as well. But we're curating a lot more of what we used to call extracurricular that we're now realizing actually is really fundamental to shaping the student's educational experience. We've got another question from the rear. Uh, <coughs> so I really like, uh, particularly in uh, Professor Karana and Professor uh, Layman's comments, um, the idea that part of this, a large part of this problem seems to be a kind of peculiar marriage between the discipline of economics and the institutions of business schools. In some way, a strange kind of meeting point that you both identified um, with uh, principal agency theory. Uh, and I guess my question is, what strategies might exist for addressing that part of the problem? In some sense that Economics and business are not the same thing, and in some way they become strangely elided. And um, so what, what are ways to kind of perhaps pry apart that um, connection, particularly given that um, you know, across uh, the social sciences, particularly, if anything, the, the strength of economistic modes of inquiry uh, in sort of adjacent fields like political science and, and sociology are only becoming stronger. I think that, that, that uh, you know, business, all professional schools, it, I'm giving you an optimistic spin on this, is, is you know, in, in universities these days, everybody's very frustrated with the uh, lack of interdisciplinarity and the lack of applicability of much of research. Um, I mean, nobody's going to want the classics department to do applied research. But professional schools are a venue where you can really experiment freely with cross-disciplinarity and with applicability. Um, so in theory, this is my throw to you, Rakesh, uh, that business schools can fill themselves with sociologists and anthropologists and historians and, and political scientists. Um, even in the research realms of these fields, it can have ethnographers as well as quants. Um, and you can imagine a very kind of rich scholarly atmosphere where 
you know, because at least in the old days, the 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 target of the school was the organization. There's all sorts of interesting things to uh, to think about and study that aren't just economics. I, I I think that's a really, you know, you know, important idea. In fact, it's when business schools were founded, they were purposely set apart from economics department because the belief was economics had actually nothing or very little to say about management. It would be sort of like starting journalism in an English department mm-hmm. or literature or you know. It didn't seem right. I think that potential does exist. It existed at a couple of high points in the history of business education at Carnegie Mellon University in particular, which was an era where Herbert Simon and others was very fruitful, political scientists, sociologists, economists, uh, people, managers actually from practice, all kind of mixed and tried to understand each other. The interesting thing is, is that when you get to a business school, when there was like no goal, in the case of Carnegie Mellon, they were trying to become a high-status business school. People go back to their own tribes and kind of water their fire hydrants. Mm-hmm. What we've and here's a slight optimistic thing that I've seen happen at HBS in the last couple of years. In the wake of the financial crisis, but more importantly, in the wake of the declining competitiveness of the United States, we have organized a project called U.S. Competitiveness, because out of slight self-interest, it turns out that there are not high-status universities associated with declining economies. So if you went 100 years ago and were looking for the best universities, you would have started in exactly. Germany and France and England, etc. And then it turns out that most people, as we see in some of the public universities, see universities as a luxury rather than a necessity. So our sense out of self-interest is that we've got to get the U.S. competitive again. That, in fact, all these transactional people that we graduated actually, in the long run, have actually eaten our seed corn. Um, <laughs> So what we have is this project, and it's problem-driven. And because it's problem-driven, it actually forces the faculty into a very different kind of position, which is getting people to talk to each other in ways that I have not seen before. And so it's interesting. I think problem-driven, maybe even out of a Hobbesian self-interest. Yeah, Mm -hmm. no, that's... that's, The one other thing, just to note for the record, which you may know, is... There's this whole other argument that the real way to do it is keep everybody an economist but change economics. Like, have you ever seen the Naked Capitalism <laughs> website run by Eve Smith and a bunch of her buddies? That that's that's the sort of reinvent economics to be more humane theory. George so, Soros is trying to do that too. Yeah, yeah. You know? but I would be more on the interdisciplinary than that. Yeah. Um, but another hand during the second round. Oh yes, no, really. Thank hand. you. <laughs> I think in the U.S. business school. There seems to be sameness of the program. We have thousands of business schools, of course, um, excluding the elite business schools. It seems to me that we have a program that are at least uh, geared towards one size fits all. But I think once you step out of the United States, the context changes, then it seems like you are applying these ideas in their economics. Of course, I'm glad you mentioned about sociology, anthropology. But there are hundreds of countries, I think only about 10, 20% of the knowledge can be really applied on the street, barring some small business. Or at least it's my opinion. That there is, seems to me there's a disconnect in some ways. There's no need for business schools to be attached to a university. In fact, the first business schools, like the ones you see around the world now, are actually for-profit right now and largely not connected to university. That was actually the same story in the United States. The United States in the 1880s had scores of business schools, many of them actually in New York, the Hamilton School, the Eastman Schools, that were educating thousands of people a year in the basic bureaucratic techniques of accounting and control and you know, filing systems. The argument that was made is that they were just teaching mere technical skills, that they didn't infuse students with a sense of higher purpose and to recognize their responsibilities that they had. And I think what's interesting is that in some ways the problem with the business school issue, unlike medicine and law, is that we had a field of dreams approach, which is if we build a business school, the profession will come. Unlike medicine and law, which actually had its professionalization project outside of the university and then actually went into. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're seeing around the world is pretty much what you're saying is that outside the elite business schools, it's 
those local business schools, many of them which are for profit, they're actually thriving. The question is the quality is very all over the place, and some of them tend to be quite exploitative of the students. Um, yeah, we've got kind of have our hands. David? Yeah, so we've heard a lot about business schools, but we haven't heard a lot about business, and I'm struck by two facts. So fact number one, uh, there's fewer than half as many public corporations today than there was 15 years ago. And fact number two, um, I graduated from Penn in 09, so lots of Wharton friends, they all went into eye making and management consulting, but now they're all in startup culture, right? They've moved all out to California. They're these very lean, very, very small companies, which is like four of their friends and then a bunch of angel investors, right? So I'm wondering, not should business schools exist, but what should business schools look like with a very, very different kind of corporate landscape than there was, say, you know, 30 years ago with the large conglomerates, or you know, 50 years ago with the large vertically integrated, manager-driven um, hierarchies. So, do you want to take that on, Mark? Yeah. Well, I think as I was alluding to, I think they probably look very different from they are now. The or, or people don't go to them at all because with those kind of companies, uh, smaller, lean, I'm not sure a lot of the, what you learn at business school is actually terribly relevant. Yeah. I mean, I know the business schools attract entrepreneurial types, but I was there at the last time. I was in, I'm was i old enough to have been there when the dot-com boom was there. And, you know, suddenly students weren't wearing suits, they were wearing turtlenecks and jeans and, you know, funny-looking sneakers and statement glasses and, you know... But that's where the money was. And when, as soon as the money wasn't there anymore, they went back to investment yeah, banking. I, I want to just yeah, <laughs> echo that, that, that um, people go to these schools to find favorable risk-reward ratios mm-hmm. for their own lives. Mm-hmm. And so as the situation changes, um, they'll change pretty rapidly, and uh, the school will at least notionally change its curriculum. So Harvard Business School in 1972 probably had no courses with the word entrepreneurship in them. I remember um, uh, I was a Harvard College freshman in 1972 and I was taking a freshman seminar and there was another student in the class who was the child of a Stanford political science professor and he used the word entrepreneur in class. And I remember thinking, feeling this hot blush of shame because I had never heard the word before, <laughs> which is inconceivable for a Harvard freshman today. And I was afraid to raise my hand and say, what's an entrepreneur? So I sort of ran home and looked it up in the dictionary. So Harvard Business School then had no entrepreneurship courses. Now it has lots of entrepreneurship courses and lots of professors with the word entrepreneurship in their title. So they'll kind of shape shift. A lot of your friends you know, who work for these startups, almost by definition, they'll go out of business and then, you know, there'll be a little less excitement around that set of ideas. Um, But, you know, clearly people, these schools reorient and all the professional schools are having to do this, including us. We used to train people, you know, to the idea that you get out of school and you get a job at the Bergen Record and you work there two years and then you get a job as a Metro reporter at the New York Times and you're there for 40 years. But we don't train. So a lot of our students are working for startups in journalism, too. If there was a hand over here. Yes. yes. For Professor Lina, uh, you mentioned um, pre-principal agency time period. There were about 10 competing theories. Mm-hmm. And I was just wondering if you could give us a few examples of the competing theories and if they're equally reductive in trying to find that one source. Well, I think I'm, I'm, I have to tell you, I'm, 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 I'm working on this now, and I'm signed up to give a, a big lecture in January of next year, which is going to be about this. So you're catching me uh, at a moment when I haven't finished preparing for it. But, y- you know, off the top of my head, um, in the world we're in today, I would say there are terms that you hear, like social justice, human rights. They tend to be in the eye of the beholder, but to live on the left. Um, and and uh, but the, there's the same argument that you know you you there's a killer variable that that is the is, that you must solve for, and and not and and often by bypassing. Um, uh, bypassing existing structures, including governments and, and so on, and, and just get in and solve the problem. Um, there are a number of, uh, 
you know, if you're doing an intellectual history, there's a wonderful book uh, by a former Columbia provost called uh, The Governmental Process um, that's by uh, David Truman, a political scientist, published in 1951. That's kind of the last days of empire. It's a book that says pluralism, American-style pluralism is the best of all possible worlds. And it's very intelligent, it's not dumb at all. And, and that's kind of the last moment when a major American thinker was almost the last moment was prepared to present this. Um, um, among a bunch of possibilities, I would cite um, Ralph Nader in his earlier and, and, and less kind of out there days. Um, I'd also cite uh, in... in Deregulation really took off in the Jimmy Carter administration. We forget um, the Civil Aeronautics Board was abolished, and a number of other regulatory agencies. And again, it was the idea that that there, uh, serving the lowest price to the customer, was was the answer to everything, and not um, you know having these kind of embedded oligarchic, uh, legally built unshakable corporate structures that fed into regulatory agencies. Banking is a great example. Um, ATT, which you have written about so much and so well, is a great example. Um, there was a, just a tremendous dissatisfaction across the board with the idea of what had been a stable landscape of large organizations in government and outside of government that created these kind of ecologies of regulators or large institutions, labor unions, et cetera, and, and that that was uh, sort of, you know, hurting somebody, a average people, minorities and women. There were, there were many candidates for who was hurting, and they all were being hurt. So, you know, that's not wrong. You think of Daniel Rogers' Age of Rapture. Yeah, Rapture, yeah. That's a, a book that came out a couple of years ago that won yeah. the Bancroft Prize, right? Yeah, which um, is about this the collapse of this kind of over-determined, over-socialized world of the progressives. You know, just to riff off what you said, I think is a really fascinating view because I think connecting it back to the earlier question about economics, what is interesting about left economics, you know, kind of leftist economics, was that it always took the perspective of labor. Mm -hmm. So that was the protagonist that was always the concern. The right version of economics always concerned about the consumer. Mm -hmm. which is getting the cheapest price and the most innovation in products right. and services. And so in many ways, it, it's interesting to sort of just think about the foreground background that within the, a single discipline, you could actually capture both of those kind of essential tensions that exist. I mean, it's a really... Mm -hmm. And I think there was a debate within the critical economists as well as the more consumer about, wait, they, aren't we both on the left, but how could you, Alfie Kahn, be like right. about deregulating? Because you know that means the end of the unions, right? right? And uh, it's interesting... Yeah, I mean, the left and the right united in the view that Consumed. regulation was bad because right. it was co-opting. Right. And yeah. there's a remarkable, the capture theory. The capture theory. Yeah. It's remarkable coming together of strange bad John. Yeah. I just have a question. So philanthropy and the rise of, you know, philanthropy using the same skills as, that the business profession would have, and this is a really growing thing, and maybe that's one way in. Um, and then is it possible to create an identity, a core curriculum, which is a, around a, a, you know, a, a new identity that includes management, philanthropy, and what the effect of the business person on the world? That's happening. All the business schools have philanthropy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the Kennedy School is very upset, actually, because this is the territory of social responsibility yeah. that they've been in, social enterprise, and yeah. you know we're not kind of extending our reach, and it, and it really does create a lot of problems. So now that I'm uh, not going to be a dean for very much longer, this is something I have a lot of experience with. And uh, so you know how, like, in the old James Bond movies, James would stumble, he would open a little hole somewhere, and there'd be this giant underground operation run by the bad guy? Uh, so in my mind, there's a place like that where they take 
newly rich people and teach them to quote unquote strategic philanthropy or venture philanthropy. Um, but it's you know so so when they come into my airspace as a fundraiser, I get you know these same kinds of questions that hover around private equity deals and hedge funds and so on applied to you know donors. And and it's it's a huge bleed, you know, from this kind of thinking associated with business school into the philanthropic world. And along with that, and along with what some of what I was saying before, is a tendency among elites to think only philanthropy can solve problems in society and the state can never solve problems. Right. Rikesh, you've written about this, that you don't want business people to make their pile and then become philanthropists. But you don't want yeah. that to be the operative. Yeah, I, I think because, you know, I mean, the model that we typically call that in business schools, learn, earn, and give. You know, <laughs> get your education, earn as much money as possible, as quickly as possible, hopefully leaving with your soul somewhat intact and then give back <laughs> a little bit. And I think what, for me, is... Ironically, many of my colleagues who do this actually are kind of closet Marxists because they actually don't recognize that business actually creates value. That in the process of running a well-managed and a well-run organization, you create enormous social value. I mean, I, you know, many of the problems that I think that we confront as a society, childhood obesity, issues around the environment, issues um, you know, around um, pandemics, I mean, you need business as part of the solution. It's, it's an incredible institution. And I think what it has done is it's actually in the minds of our students is that they feel like they have to check their values at the door. And I think that's created a really, this has created the short-sightedness that you've talked about. And in a weird way made them closet Marxists because the idea is that somehow you're in the get in, get rich, get out. And, and I think that's part of the decline in U.S. competitiveness. I think it's the issue around philanthropy, it's like, I'm Hindu, my wife is Catholic, and she always tells me all well, these things you can do in Catholic, like, you know, at the end of the day, you just, like, accept Jesus, and everything gets erased. It's, like, so awesome, but in Hinduism, like, it doesn't work that way. Like, you, you can't erase all of the things, so you burn down the forest, or, you know, cut down all the trees. The irony is that the university, in my own, I think in our own way, is actually legitimating this model. Because look at who it celebrates, who it names its buildings after. And I brought this up. We're about to engage in a big multi-billion dollar capital campaign. I said, at the business school? At the, no, at the university, at the university and the business school is part of yeah. this. And, you know, they were telling me about this incredibly generous donor who was in private equity, et cetera. And I said to them, do they manage some of our money? I go, they go, yeah. And I, and I said, so we're going to reward them for a 2% 20 fee we gave them, and they're going to give us a little back, and we're going to talk about how honorable this was. Like, I mean, there's a weird logic that's kind of emerged in all of this, but I think our students get it, because our students are Hobbesian, and maybe it's not money, but it's status and honor. Mm -hmm. They And they see how our institutions actually reward those things, and that's where they've oriented a lot of their action, um, their agency. Yeah. We've got time probably for three or four more questions. And I see one here, and we've got two more, and maybe one or two. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if part of the problem, uh, I think, right now is, uh, well, perhaps, or, or lack of values, um, is this anything that business schools talk about, like sort of in the faculty, and, and or uh, is this something that you think that business schools can do something about? I mean, we do talk about it a lot now. I mean, I think in many ways our own sense of, you know, as a faculty member, you want to feel like you're doing something good. Um, and I think we do talk about it a lot. I think we've made some substantial changes. Our dean, who was just selected a couple of years ago, is the first non-finance dean that we've had in 75 years, who is not coming from an economics background. Um, he's born in another country, which is also pretty unique. Um, and he's emblematic of a large number of trends. If you look at the deans at Northwestern's Kellogg School, um, uh, it's a, a woman from the psychology department that's also you know, non-economics in George Washington, a sociologist has been appointed dean. So I think there is this, this kind of movement away and a rethinking of the curriculums, Georgetown. Um, the, the question is, is you know, can we get that students to buy into this? Can we create an engaging enough experience for the students so they don't feel like networking and credentialism is the primary purpose of business education. And we had some questions. Yes. Um, this question is for Martin. I was curious about what you said about the B-schoolification of university administration, um, the superstar salaries, 
kind of the deference to corporate recruitment. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about education reform. I'm wondering if maybe the schoolification of a university is not such a bad thing. It doesn't really seem like the principals and agents are really aligned, or rather, those who manage universities, no offense, are not always, you know, doing what's best for company value or university value. So could you talk more about that? Well, I would say uh, one, one would hold a university to a higher, um, higher value. I think the whole, if one goes back to the foundation of the university in Paris and Oxford and Cambridge in the 10th, 11th century, uh, it was very much research-based, clerical-based, uh, and knowledge for its own sake rather than, rather than um, ap applied. Uh, and I would, I would argue that that should still apply as a whole to the university. Clearly, the university has to balance its books, um, and how it does that is, is up to it. But um, I wouldn't apply the, the, the sort of strict Hobbesian profit and loss account to, to the university as a whole. Right. So, I mean, that kind of older model of the university works when higher education is something that the elite gets. But today, it's more like the price of admission for entry into the middle class, and the price of college is more and more and more expensive. So, you know, is it really feasible to say that this is about knowledge itself? Well, the, the question is, you know, um, I want to sort of challenge you a little bit on this and ask you, how do you measure university value? Um, is it just a pure kind of uh, P&L calculation to the student getting the degree? If so, uh, you know, the, the conversation is a little skewed in places like this. There's a very good piece that was in the Chicago Tribune uh, last week by uh, Michael McPherson and Sandy Baum, in which they point out that only 1% of American university students pay $50,000 or, or more a year in tuition. So what people say they long for is, is readily available, you know, only a few miles from us. So the real question, I mean, I'm, I'm being maybe a little defensive here, but, you know, why would you go to Columbia when you could go to City College of New York if you were a New York City resident? It's cheaper. It's way cheaper. Um, and, and, you know, arguably you'll get as much or almost as much individual attention as a student. Um, so why wouldn't you make this, this sort of cost-benefit calculation that I'm going to turn down Columbia and go to City? Um, and I think the reason is that most people, if given the chance to go to Columbia instead of City, would go to Columbia, partly because Columbia would offer them a lot of financial aid. Um, most students here that I've met, particularly undergraduates, if you sort of explain what research universities are, and the costs associated with it would say, A, I had no idea, and B, I don't like that. If you said to them, how would you like it if this university had only professors whose only job was to teach, and if they were caught on company time doing anything but being with students and teaching, they'd be fired. Most students would say, that'd be great, um, I think. But I think that to complexify it, you want to be here because it's one of the world's greatest research universities, but it's kind of a three-cushion shot why that registers in your mind as valuable rather than it's just thrilling to know that Richard John, part of my you know tuition is going to pay for Richard to write a piece for a small circulation historical journal. I just love being able to do that. <laughs> you know? so, so there's some sort of alchemic process by which are taking your money and using it to pay for Richard to write for an academic journal benefits you in some indirect way, at least by your revealed preference to come here against a non-research university that's much cheaper. So, so, so it's interesting. Let me, let me just spin your thing a slightly different way in defense of her view. So I think you, you, ha you have what I would, if, you know, until I became un involved with undergraduate life three or four years ago, very similar view, which is a human capital view of what you get in education. And I think that was the dominant perspective. It's one that Gary Becker and others have talked about. And you mentioned before there's a kind of signaling 
question, then there's a treatment question. Mm -hmm. The idea was signaling we select well. The treatment was you learned something. But I don't think we have actually a good theory anymore of higher education because when I talk to the students about what they're here for, there is something about social status. There's something about looking for potential mates mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. of similar yeah. Yeah. social, not just friends who are going to help you, but actually mates for life. Um, there is all sorts of other elements going on. And it's amazing to me also being now a, ch a parent of a 16-year-old, how much, and 14 and 10-year-old, how much the decisions that we made as parents were actually organized around our kids' education. Yeah. Which I've never thought, we bought our house on that basis, we make decisions about how we spend but, our you, weekends. You know, the, Do you know what I mean? I think there's something else about higher education we're not quite have a finger, but somehow we believe that this thing, whatever it is, that pays Richard's and mine's and your salary, and it may be alchemy, but it has now taken on a mystical quality that parents with enormous amounts of resources literally want to bribe to get their kids. Yeah, but this, this is fascinating to me because, you know, I, I used to be a Harvard alumni interviewer for 25 years. And I'd interview all these kids. And I'd say to them, not so directly, but I'd say essentially, tell me three things about Harvard that actually happened at Harvard. They could never answer that question, ever. Um, and I'd say, why do you want to go to Harvard? Because it's famous and prestigious. Right. And my parents want me to go there, and so on. Um, so they knew nothing about it but that. Yet they were willing to pay huge, a huge premium to invest in something they knew nothing about. There's a sociologist at Penn named Annette LaRose who's doing fascinating research on this, and I would to point this back to you, where she went out to Westchester County and met people like you and me in my younger days when I was a, a public school parent in Westchester and said, okay, why did you pick, you know, the community where you live? And they say, for the schools. And then she'd drill down and say, okay, so I'm going to ask you some questions about the schools that you made this huge life decision based on. What do you know about them? And they never knew anything about them, you know? <laughs> They just there was this signaling going on, and everybody else thought they had good schools, so therefore they knew they had good schools. Uh, it's it's a funny process, and I, I don't I mean I'm I'm not trying to be, you know, like um, hostile to this, but it, it it's there there is this kind of, you know, ec economists talk about revealed preference, right. and by revealed preference, everybody wants to come to places like Columbia and Harvard, even though. Uh, everybody thinks they're horribly overpriced, and there's all this bullshit that goes on here that, you know, must be a waste of money. That'll be why, on C-SPAN. Yeah, why? <laughs> but, but you know, why is that? I'm, or I'll ask you, why is that? I mean, um, I my my mom's on the Columbia payroll too, so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so you get to go here yeah, free. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know, but, yeah, oh. but, um, I mean, I I believe in it. I just my initial question was not so much. Like this alchemy that happens at a research university doesn't exist, but isn't there some examination that we can do with a B school lens or with a principal agent lens that would help a little bit? I'm not saying it's a black and white, yeah. black or white question. Mm -hmm. But I just, again, you have this huge market in the US with something like 4,000 4, 4, places grant a bachelor's degree. There's a very wide price range and specialization range. So actually you have unbelievably huge numbers of choices. If you say, I'm just sick of this and I want a, a lower price BA, I mean, boy, do you have a lot of choices. So, no, I mean, and you'll get the same faculty, by the way. Because they, they, most faculty produce about, about 15 or 20 PhD programs. Right. I mean, it, something like half of all law professors went to Yale Law School. Um, <laughs> So you're, you're getting these very marginal differences in professor quality. So people, as individual consumers, they can solve the problem if they have the sort of the nerve to say, I'm going for what really, you know, a real price to education ratio, and, and I'm willing to take the risk of losing this mystical credential value of the degree from a particular place that I believe is overpriced. Is there one final? I've got two questions, and this will, this will be the final two questions. Start here and then go there. Yeah. Does the so-called weakness of a manager's moral compass start before business school, or are we basically saying that uh, <laughs> <laughs> misapplied economic theories combined with a particular social setting are solely to blame? 
In other words, can we attribute certain parts of the shareholder value model or the neglecting externality model to contemporary cultural factors? I mean, I think it's an interaction fact. And I think what, what, what the thing about what business education does is it takes something that normally, historically, most of our cultural institutions are something we try to self-monitor and, in fact, often hide and turns it into a virtue. I think that's the, that's the part that really is the part where the thing that you try to restrain yourself, all of us, but it turns it in ba- and it celebrates it. The last question. So, uh, Martin, to your question, you've made a point twice about how business schools aren't focused and aren't equipped to teach entrepreneurship. And, uh, there's an increasing focus, particularly here at Columbia, and current Columbia Business School student, in terms of innovation, incubation lab, et cetera, et cetera. And then just to come back to your point around uh, whether or not business schools make sense from a risk return ratio. So I used to work in McKinsey in Johannesburg, so in South Africa, and what's brought me part of what's brought me here to Columbia is my organization has said, you need to attend a top institution because we believe that that brand, that credential, will enable you to better perform the services that we require you to do. Because when you walk into a client organization and you say, I'm a Columbia MBA or I'm a Harvard MBA, there's an automatic granting of status and recognition. Whether or not that's deserved or not is not true. They, they not probably are helping out with the tuition too, right? right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but I mean, then that point around credentialing is primarily why many of my colleagues are here. You know, if you come to Columbia, you are more likely to be recruited by a Goldman or a McKinsey than if you go to you know, the, the university down in South Carolina. Yeah, I mean, everybody should comment it, but I want to refer you to a quarterly journal of economics paper that just came out in February, in which, I mean, it's a fantastic piece of work. It's a, they ran a random experiment with textile factories in India, where they literally taught people management techniques. And the improvements that happened in, are just remarkable, 17, 34, 40% type of improvements that... In, enable them to increase employment, enable them to produce more, pay labor higher. This is the part that I think is the danger, is that when it becomes a credentialing exercise, what people don't recognize is that management is actually really important. If you want to have a really crappy day, be managed poorly. <laughs> if you want to take it out on your partner and your kids, be managed poorly. I think this is the connection that many of our <laughs> students miss, is that when... You are managed well, and you are working together toward a cooperative and shared goal. There is nothing that... that it's Rousseauian. You jump from Hobbes to Rousseau. You feel great, actually. And I think that's where our students have really lost that... Um, I, I, th- I, think that hard, I think it is hard for business schools to teach entrepreneurialism because I think the, the basic mindset is different. You, you, you are, as an entrepreneur, you're breaking the mold and, 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 and making um, connections which you wouldn't otherwise do and I think that kind of thinking is not easily taught by anyone let alone within a business school where you have a much more uh, managerial approach to things I mean uh, most business schools now are trying to teach entrepreneurialism Stanford is very proud of what it says it's done in this area um, but you know I think I think there's a, there's sort of there's a basic conflict there I it's the whole question of credentialism is is sort of a interesting chicken and egg question that I can't answer. Hypothetically, could you have a very prestigious institution that was just terrible, and because it's it's and and would would its credential value degrade over time? Um, in other words, it, it may be that the credential value is reflects something real. Um, Certainly, if you, I mean, just, um, I want to give you a sort of anguish note here. As a higher education administrator, what the people like me do all day is fantastic obsession with relative rank against peer institutions. So we all, A, we all believe that, um, you know, the credential, you got to work for the credential value every day or you'll start losing it. And B, we just honestly, we just don't see at this moment a lot of demand elasticity. Um, so it's really hard to have the conversation around, let's just, you know, cut out all the fat and really, you know, deliver a lower cost product to our students when there doesn't seem to be genuine, actionable demand for that. It doesn't incentivize you powerfully to go there. You know, Tom Friedman wrote a column the other day about MOOCs and how great they are, and everybody can watch Michael Sandel's lectures and so on. So why doesn't anybody say, you know what, 
I'm not going to Harvard or MIT because now I can watch all the lectures online. I mean, why spend the money? God, you know, uh, people still want to go. Um, and I guess, you know, you can say they're getting robbed. They're paying for all these cushy lives of professors and fancy buildings and health clubs and gyms. The tuition's padded. Uh, it's just a credential value that they're trying to get. But if if that were true, then I would think it would self-correct over time. So on, on that hopeful note, um, <laughs> oh, one final comment? All right. Poor countries in general are poorly managed, of course. Yeah. Yeah. This is my observation, my travel. Uh, I just I thought, this is obvious, perhaps. Uh, and you mentioned that the management of textile mills. But I just returned from Eurasia and Mongolia. It seems like uh, the management is a major issue, which is just concept to be taught me. So on that hopeful note, <laughs> do indeed have something to contribute and have indeed contributed something. We'll bring to a close, and I'd like to uh, lead the round of applause for our three. Uh,